This church has had a long tradition of uh, feeling that our faith needs to be uh, spread to the community whenever we have an opportunity to do that. And over the years, we've been able to present some amazing programs with the Lay Clergy Institute. I would first of all like to say how grateful I am to the Clark Lanyon Foundation, which has provided financial support for us for many years and provided financial support for this presentation this evening. Uh, our ministry is basically one of social action in a lot of ways, and over the years we were proud to have presented a number of wonderful speakers. Uh, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross spoke in Longmont several years ago, and as a result of her talk, the Boulder County Hospice Program was founded. We had Millard Fuller here, and as a result of his speech, we were able to found uh, the Habitat for Humanity program. Uh, we've considered the death penalty with Sister Helen Prujan. We've had Rabbi Harold Kushner who wrote Why Bad Things Happen to Good People here to help us explore the depths of our faith. We've had a speaker on Islam following the 9-11 bombing of New York City to try to put a human face on the Islam religion. We were responsible for being the Vietnam traveling wall to Longmont in 2001 and we just feel like we're proud to be able to give this service to the community by bringing programs to you which we think are of importance and this one we also believe to be in that same vein. This is the second part of our uh, presentations on people with brain disorders. And last year we explored the depth of the problem and um, came to realize how many lives brain disorder brain, and brain disorder people do touch. One in four families is touched immediately by a person with brain disorder. At any one point in time, 10% of the adult population has a brain disorder. And for children under 18, 12% of their population suffer from a brain disorder. So it's a significant issue, but it's one that people don't like to talk about. And as a result, that's, we named this program Out of the Shadows because it's a difficult subject to approach, but we felt it needed to be discussed. And we are delighted tonight to have Dr. Ten Temple Grandin with us. Um, she, she is the second part of our three-part series this weekend. This afternoon we had a workshop in which we explored ways in which we could create a jobs program in Longmont for people with brain disorders. Dr. Grandin is speaking tonight and tomorrow Reverend Alan Johnson, who is the chaplain for Children's Hospital in Denver, will be giving uh, our guest sermon. We would invite you all to come back to church tomorrow morning. We're event very friendly. We don't bite. And uh, we don't chorus either. So feel free to come and feel very comfortable when you get here to hear Alan Johnson give his perspective on people who suffer from brain disorders as well. I won't spend a lot of time on Dr. Grandin's uh, credentials. She is incredibly well credentialed. She is a cor currently a professor of, assist associate professor of animal science at CSU. But most importantly, she is probably the most accomplished and best known adult with autism in the world who can speak coherently about her condition. In her lifetime, she's accomplished great things beginning at the age of two and a half or three when she was first diagnosed with autism. And the future for her looked like it was gonna be a lifetime in an institution. And rather than that, she has obtained her doctorate degree and is just accomplished wonderful things in the world of animal science. She's been an inspiration to many, and I have no doubt that this evening she will be an inspiration to us all. So please welcome Dr. Temple Grandin. I think I'll just start out just um, talking a little bit about what exactly autism is. It's a neurological disorder that the child is born with, and it varies all the way from very severe, where the person's going to remain nonverbal for the rest of their life, all the way up to geniuses like Einstein. It's a continuum of traits, and it's caused by abnormal development in the brain. It's not caused by bad parenting or anything like that. When I was a little kid, I was very lucky to get extremely good early education. If you know anybody that has a young autistic kid, you know, two or three years old, the worst thing you could do with a young autistic kid is let them sit and watch TV all day or just sit and rock. They need to get many hours 
of intensive intervention with an adult. Now there's a lot of very expensive programs out there that might cost sixty, eighty thousand dollars a year. But what I have found is good teachers have the knack on how to work with these kids. And if you're working with anybody that's low income, you know, I suggest, well, you know, go to your, you know, your church group and get, you know, some of the people there to volunteer to work with the kid. Because doing nothing is the worst thing you can do. My mother hired a nanny who spent hours just playing turn-taking games with me and my sister. And in some ways, being a child of the 50s was an advantage because the kind of games that little kids played all involved turn-taking. You know, if I wanted to play table hockey, I had to do that with somebody else. I couldn't um, do that by myself. And autistic kids aren't very social, so you've got to work on trying to get them to be more social. Well, one of the problems that people with autism have, and also some people with ADHD and some other learning problems, is problems with things like sound sensitivity. When the school bell went off, hurt my ears like a dentist drill going down my ear. You may have a person or a child that's more severe, you take them into a big store like Walmart, and they're just screaming their head off. And the reason they're screaming their head off is they feel like they're inside the speaker at the rock and roll concert. You know, but these sensory sensitivity problems are very variable. One person may have hearing sensitivity problems and hate the sound of, you know, flushing toilets, where another kid might be attracted to that. A sound that bothers one person doesn't bother another person. Um, some of them cannot stand a strong perfume. In fact, I think strong perfume needs to be banned in special ed because there are a lot of um, individuals that have problems with that. Now, the thing is, you test the hearing, the hearing's going to turn out to be normal. But the problem is, especially on the ones that remain nonverbal, they may not be hearing those hard consonant sounds. Like if I said, the dog walked down the street, they might be hearing the dog walked down the eat. They'd be just hearing vowel sounds. So my speech teacher would stretch out and enunciate the hard consonant sounds. This also works with children with Down syndrome, dyslexic kids, uh, a lot of these sensory things I'm telling you about. Are, are, occur in many different brain disorders. Don't get hung up on these diagnostic categories. You know, like whether it's autism, Asperger, or PDD. To be autistic, a kid has to have uh, delayed speech development plus other autistic behaviors. Obvious, obvious at age three, something's drastically wrong. An Asperger kid, there's no obvious speech delay, and they're just kind of the odd. <coughs> You know, the kind of nerd kid, you should just call them computer nerds. And when they get into high school, they often get horribly teased. And I was one of those kids that got horribly teased. And this is where a mentor teacher can really make the difference. I had a great science teacher when I was in high school. And when I was being teased and I got kicked out of school for throwing a book at a girl who teased me, <laughs> um, my science teacher gave me a reason to study. Because my goal was to want to become a scientist. And oftentimes, you know, you have a kid that's a mild Asperger's. You know, he might be fixated on trains. <coughs> well, use the train to teach reading. Use the train to teach math. Take that interest, <coughs> take that interest and broaden it out. You know, take that interest to motivate. Don't try to stomp it out. What you want to do is broaden it out. You know, when a kid gets more advanced, maybe you can uh, use a train to teach science and physics and a whole lot of different things. Now, you know, there's a lot of problems with people with autism with eye contact. They tend to not have good eye contact. And this is a study that Ami Klin did where they put an electronic uh, hat on a person that could track the vision. And the normal person looks back and forth a whole bunch of times between the eyes. The autistic person doesn't look back and forth at all. And this is the movie, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, which I happen to find really boring because it's totally social, you know, where, where things that are more technical I find a whole lot more interesting. And, but the thing is, social doesn't explain this whole picture. Look at how many times a normal person looks back and forth. There's attention shifting delays in many brain disorders, in head injuries, dyslexia, learning problems, schizophrenia, tension shifting is going to be much, much slower. It takes longer time to shift back and forth. Also, the person with autism is looking at the math. Well, they don't hear very well. 
even though they passed that hearing test, they're not hearing auditory detail. So that's why they're looking at the mouth. This just shows um, research that was done with kids that are echolalic. This is where they repeat back what's been said, the TV commercial kind of things. And as problems with receptive language get worse, echolalia goes up. Because it's kind of like repeating back what's been said. Now, one other thing, another thing we've got to look at are we have sensory sensitivities. You know, like some people with autism can't stand fluorescent lights. Also, some people with dyslexia, ADHD, and even head injuries cannot tolerate fluorescent lights because they can see the 60 cycle flicker. And the lights like flicking on and off like a discotheque. But another problem that you can get into, so I get this so I can see that better. But another problem you can get into is, is central processing problems where there are some people with dyslexia and autism where the visual image breaks up into a mosaic. This is not a hallucination like schizophrenia. This is a problem with the visual system not processing the image right. You see, in your brain, you've got motion circuits, color circuits, and shape circuits. Those have got to work together to make coherent images. And things are going wrong in the brain, and these things are not working together. Now, sometimes a person that has this problem can be helped with a thing called Erlen colored lenses. And Erlen colored lenses are basically just colored glasses, and you try on all these different colored glasses until you find the color where your visual system stabilizes. Well, and I used to love to play with automatic doors. I was attracted to rapid motion. And what some of the research is showing is that there's something wrong in the brain with the circuits that process rapid motion. And that's spilling over into other things it shouldn't be spilling over into. And when they go to read, you know, words can be really hard to read because they're kind of jiggling and vibrating on the page. You know, see, in the child or the adult, and I've found a lot of adults that have this problem. In fact, in my livestock handling class where I have students do drawings, out of 60 students, I find one or two every semester that have this problem. And I can tell by the way they goofed up way they do their drawings. They can't figure out where the center of the circle is. And they might say the print is wiggling or squirming on the page. Well, you try on, uh, like, like if you're in a low-income situation, um, go down to the sunglass store or down to Walmart. It's got a good selection for $12.95 of real pale sunglasses. You can't read with dark glasses. You've got to try real pale ones, pale blues, pale pinks, pale purples, pale browns. And you try on just the right pale color until the print stops jiggling. I know that sounds kind of crazy. But um, I had a dyslexic student, and her career getting her PhD was saved by those glasses. Now, you can actually go to the Erlen Institute and try on the right specific color, and that often works even better. Another thing is you want to use a laptop computer because TV-type computers flicker. Now, how about flat panel screens? Some are okay and some are not. And the big, fat, flat panels like that often have fluorescent lights hiding inside them. Those are going to be bad. The only screen that I know is a good screen for these people is one that's really thin, like the screen on a laptop. So my student got the Erlen colored lenses, and then she got a laptop computer. And without those two things, she would have flunked out of school. You know, sometimes you can do some interventions that are really simple. Nobody really knows why these glasses work. Some doctors think that's all nonsense. But the problem is, if you have 20 people with autism, maybe two will benefit from those glasses. But boy, those two will really benefit. And I mean, it's a simple thing to do. I mean, take a book down to Walmart, try on all the pale ones, and you're going to know. I mean, how, why, I mean how stupid to flunk out of school and lose a job because you didn't buy a $12.95 pair of glasses from Walmart. You know, that's just ridiculous. Here's an example of a bad classroom for special ed. It's 100% fluorescent lighting. You've got no wall between the rooms, so you've got the problem of, of all the background noise coming in from the other room. See, one of the problems with head injuries, dyslexia, autism, you know, and the thing is, these things are very variable. So one person may have a problem with background noise and they can't hear, and others are not going to have a problem with this. It's an extremely variable condition. Okay, now here are some behavior problems that, that, you know, in kids, 
and young adults can be caused by the condition. And we're going to need to make some accommodations, like problems with sound sensitivity, things like smoke alarms and fire alarms, having tantrums in large supermarkets. Another problem is scratchy clothing. Well, let's get clothing that's not scratchy. Another big frustration is poor handwriting because of motor control problems in the hands. You know what I say? That's what computers are for. And forget about correct typing. There's nothing wrong with hunting and pecking because the important thing is literacy. You want the kid to be literate and problems with fluorescent lights. These can really be problems. Now, if you're stuck with an office or a school that's got fluorescent lights, one of the simple things you can do is just get a light bulb with a 100-watt incandescent lamp, you know, old-fashioned light bulb, put that next to your desk. Wearing a hat can also help because it helps screen it out. Getting your desk over by a window can help. These are just simple accommodations that you can do for some of these problems with fluorescent lights. Now, as I said before, autism is a continuum. It goes all the way from remaining very severe and nonverbal up to really bright kids that are just kind of, you know, the odd kind of kids. And being a child of the 50s was an advantage because we were taught social rules. We were taught to say please and thank you. We were taught that you can't make comments about fat people. And there's people today getting fired because they made comments about fat people can't fit in the elevator. Well, that's, um, I was taught when I was a little kid, you can't say those kind of things. You know, table manners were taught. You know, and I think it's very important, especially for some of these smart kids that are Asperger, you know, they need to learn not to be slobs, you know, have decent table manners. Also, I had consistent discipline between home and school. There was no way I could kind of manipulate mom against the teacher. There was no way I could do that. And my abilities in art were nurtured. It's very important to take the things that the child is good at or the adult is good at and let's build these into job skills, into skills that people want. I took my ability in art and drawing and developed that into designing livestock handling facilities. In fact, over at the Swift plant and the XL plant in Fort Morgan, they have equipment that I've designed. The entire front end of the Fort Morgan plant I laid out. Swift has a restrainer system I designed. I mean, those big plants, are, they're handling all their cattle and equipment I designed. That's pretty good for somebody who thought it was going to go to an institution. Um, I also want to really, I really want to give a lot of credit to good teachers. I mean, good te I had great teachers when I was a little kid. And I had a great teacher when I was in high school, I'm a science teacher. I was a goof around student that just wasn't interested in studying. I just didn't see any reason to study. And Mr. Carlock gave me a reason to study because I wanted to be a scientist. And when I went to college, for the first two years I was in college, Mr. Carlock brought me over to his house every weekend and we'd do science projects. I mean, if it hadn't been for Mr. Carlock, I would not have succeeded. You know, and then, of course, you know, it's bad behavior like swearing and stuff like that. I mean, I was just taught that, you know, you just don't say those words. Now, how do you figure out, especially with individuals that are on the higher end of the spectrum, where what kind of things they might be good at doing? We're not thinking enough. Even when some of these kids go to college, what are they going to do for jobs? We're not thinking enough about that. And if the child's going to be a visual thinker, drawing ability will usually show up in third or fourth grade. Now, when I did something bad and I got sent to my room, I, you know, I might get TV taken away for one night, but my parents never, ever took away drawing materials. You know, things that the kid's good at, we need to be nurturing those skills because I've heard sad, sad, sad stories where, like, the drawing was, like, stomped out of a kid. Well, they got so hung up on just getting them to do what they wanted in this school in a real rigid way is that they stomped out the thing that could be the, guy, the kid's career when he grew up. I have a friend right now, a really good friend, where she's got a really smart kid. He's not autistic, but he has some you know, motor control problems with his hands. Uh, he's got a few learning problems, and he's brilliant in other subjects. And the teachers just don't understand it with this kid. You know, they kind of want to stomp him. You know, he's in the third grade right now, stomp him into the same mold with the other kids. And, you know, and they're going to get the kids so demoralized that he's going to just give up. And that'd be a terrible thing to do. And they're going to have him go to a different school. 
Now, I think in pictures. Not everybody on the autism spectrum thinks in pictures, but I do. And what do I mean by thinking in pictures? You know, when I think about stuff, my mind works like Google for images. If I don't have a picture in my head, I have no thought. Now, this is not an hallucination. Let's clarify, I know some of you are working with schizophrenia, and I want to clarify the difference between things like a visual imagination and problems with the writing squirming on the page, which is a pro defect in the brain's system for processing images, and hallucinations. There's a, there's a really, really big difference. Visual thinking is a way of thinking. In fact, in most people, it's a subconscious way of thinking. See, language covers up the sensory-based thinking. And in my book, Animals in Translation, I talk about how animals, you know, think in pictures, think in sounds, non-language-based thinking. And a lot of people, especially highly verbal thinkers, it's covered up. And it's not hallucination. It's how I think. And I think by associating pictures into categories. Now, an hallucination, one of the classic things of schizophrenic delusions, uh, there's always something out there controlling a person. Like a satellite dish is controlling them, or a microchip got planted in their butt, or something weird thing like that is controlling them. <laughs> uh, you know, the FBI is sending out, you know, a secret ray that is controlling them. There's some outside thing out there that's somehow controlling them. And there's voices telling them to do stuff. You know, where, where the problem with the, you know, the writing wiggling on the page, the problem is, is the visual system is just not working right. See, that's in a different part of the brain. And visual thinking is, just, is how I think. It's not a hallucination, it's how I think. Like when I design equipment, I can test run that equipment in my head in full motion video. I didn't know that other people couldn't do that. <laughs> well, there's a picture taken from the top of the water tower at the XL plant in Fort Morgan. And here's another one of my facilities down in Brazil. And I really like this job because I like to fantasize about what the archaeologists are going to think that's for when they dig it up in the future. <laughs> and obviously, of course, it had great religious significance. <laughs> There's a gorgeous owl that a person with autism did. And you can sometimes have people with autism that are very severely handicapped, much more handicapped than I am, and they can do beautiful artwork like this. Now, how do you form a concept when your mind works like Google for images? Well, this is a picture that a young man sent to me to show how he puts pictures into categories. And here, dogs and cats are being separated into separate categories. Because making categories, that's the beginning of making a concept. And uh, first of all, I just did it by size, OK? A dog's bigger than the cat. The only problem is, when you get a little dog in the neighborhood, you can no longer sort them by size anymore. So I had to form a new category. And the new category was the shape of the nose. Because no matter how weird the nose the dog is, the nose is always the same. And I could separate cats and dogs by the shape of their nose. That's forming a new category. Now, I have found that on the autistic spectrum, the, the brains tend to specialize. Visual thinking is just one kind. You'll also find this sometimes with people with dyslexia, people with ADHD, people with a lot of different brain disorders. Skills are going to be uneven. They're often going to be very good at one thing and very terrible at something else. And as a visual thinker, I'm very good at drawing. I'm very good at certain kinds of problem solving. I'd be very good at diagnosing, you know, you know, as a medical doctor or in veterinary medicine. That'd be very easy for me. But I'm terrible at algebra because there's no way I can make a picture. And I never got to try trigger geometry. That was a big mistake in my math education. Then there's others. They're the music and math brain. They think in patterns. They don't think in pictures. They think in patterns. Good at chess. I wasn't good at chess. It was sort of like too abstract for me. And then a third type I call it verbal logic or language specialist. These people know all the weather facts, know all the baseball statistics. They're very good at factual things involving language. 
and they often tend to be very poor at drawing. Can't draw at all. The brain is specialized. And what scientific research is showing is that the brain has a whole lot of different departments and they're wired together with, with stuff called white matter. That's the computer cables that connect up the different parts of the brain. Well, the problem you got in autism is some departments get connected and others don't. See, it all depends upon where your limited good computer cables go. That's the way Eric Corshane out in San Diego describes it and in Thinking in Pictures. And I noticed back there, Borders Books has come tonight. I really thank Borders Books for coming. And they've got the new version of Thinking in Pictures that explains some of this new research. So how do you form a concept? Well, you have to, like, how do you teach this dog the concept of an intersection? By showing him whole lots of different ones. So now in his file of intersections, he's got all these different pictures. Stop signs, lights, don't have lights. If any of you are working with some of the lower functioning autistic people, you know, they might be um, obeying the rule about not running across the, the street at home, but at church they're running across the street. Thing is, you've got to teach them that it applies at church, that rule applies at home, shopping center, school, library, granny's house. You've got to show them that in 10 different places you don't run across the street. Then even a real low-functioning autistic adult or child will get the concept that you don't run across the street. Now, there's been a scientist in Pittsburgh named Dr. Nancy Minshew, and she's done some really great work, and she's found that people with autism have, have problems making up new categories for things. Like if I said to them, they're, pick out all the objects that have the color red on them. They can do that. But if I said, make up a new, make me up some new categories for these objects, like contains cloth, contains metal, it's round. And one of the things we can help, you know, people with autism to be more flexible in thinking is, is um, playing games with doing things with categories. But don't be surprised if they put the videotapes in the round category, because after all, there's round spools inside the tapes. Now, even something abstract, in my mind, is visualized. You know, teach sharing by dividing up the juice evenly. When I think about hurry up, I get pictures of hurry up and catch that airport shuttle before it goes away. And I see that. You know, hurry up and get that cab. And I'm seeing it. Now, how about really abstract things like religious concepts? Well. Truly abstract things I cannot even think about. Because if I don't have a picture, I don't have a thought. Now this is my childhood picture for the power and the glory in the Lord's Prayer. We got a rainbow with an electric power tower, you know, high tension electric tower at the base of the rainbow. And I took this picture here in Colorado. There's no computer tricks or Photoshop here. I shot this one. There was a bad storm coming, and I shot this one, and it, this is the real thing. But there's certain really abstract things I just don't understand. And some of you will think that autistic learning is just memorization. In the beginning, it is. But as I put more and more and more information onto my brain, I now got more web pages inside my head that I can search then I can recombine those things into different categories and be less rigid. The more I can learn, and the thing about social skills, you know, I have to learn social skills like being in a play. And you've got to learn how to act in different situations. Now, a lot of people with autism, also some dyslexics and people with some other problems, are very good at this hidden figure test. OK, now you see the figure there on the right. How many of you can see that figure um, see that figure inside that other figure. Raise your hand if you can see it. Oh, we're doing good here. Oh, boy, we got a whole bunch of visual thinkers. Sometimes uh, do really terrible. Now, when you put the person in the brain scan machine, really interesting thing happens. Just the visual part of the brain gets turned on, and all the other language stuff and frontal cortex stuff is shut off. Where the normal brain doesn't do as well on this because language and other things gets turned on, kind of interferes with this. Now I want to show you how I can use visual thinking in a more abstract kind of way. This is a visual symbol picture. 
for the brain scan of the autistic person. It's like a little cabin in the middle of the wilderness and everything else is shut off. I know that's not a brain scan. This is a visual symbol picture. This is how I use visual thinking in a more abstract way. And the brain scan of the normal person is like this lamp store. Got so many lights turned on here. I don't know which one is the visual part of the brain. And I put that office building under construction up to remind me to talk about interconnectedness in the brain. In the normal brain, everything's connected to everything else. Brains with problems, this is not true. In head injuries, the injury rips apart computer cables. In things like autism, and even in bipolar disorder, there's computer cables that fail to grow where they need to be growing. But the end result is going to be the, the brain doesn't get the massive interconnectedness. You get a person that's low functioning, there's, there's computer cables that aren't wired for really basic stuff like hearing things accurately. Um, there's a person named Tito who can type and he talks about having a thinking self and a feeling self. Sort of like his consciousness is split. And it's because the computer cables that wire that stuff together aren't wired together. The thing is, is when you hear a word, see a word, speak a word, or think about a word, different parts of the brain are turned on. And in the normal brain, these are all wired together with lots and lots of different interconnections. And brains with problems are often missing a lot of interconnections. Now, there's a certain type of Alzheimer's that gives some real insight into some of these savant skills. You know, where you have, now not, you know, you have a lot of low functioning people with autism, they don't have savant skills. In fact, it really annoys parents of some of these kids when someone comes up to them in the supermarket and say, well, what's your kid's savant skill? Well, he doesn't have one. But when you get, but there's maybe only five or 10% of the autistic population is gonna have so-called savant skills where you have somebody that's super good at music or super good at art. But, they, but even in the high end, like the Asperger's, there's still uneven skills. Well, what, how, what, how do these savant skills work? Well, there's a certain type of Alzheimer's disease that gives insight into this. There's a type of Alzheimer's disease called frontal temporal lobe dementia. Eats out the language parts of the brain. And after it wrecks the language parts of the brain, art and music talent come out. And this picture here was painted by one of these patients. It was published in the journal Neurology. And there's another one of these really nice pieces of art. And for teaching number skills, let's keep it simple. Let's also keep it visual. You have different lengths of rods for different numbers. You see, you've got to make numbers non-abstract. Teach fractions by cutting up an apple, cutting up a pie, a half of something, a quarter of something. You know, teach adding and subtracting by having little objects that they can touch and feel. And I thought this was very, very clever from the TEACH program, the teaching subtraction. Here's 5 minus 1 equals 4. And when you take away a piece, you bag it. You took it away, so you bagged it. That teaches the concept of taking away. Okay, now I want to get into talking more about some emotional things. There's a lot of research that shows that the emotion circuits aren't hooked up right. There's some new research on things called mirror neurons. You know, like for example, if, if I was brushing my hair, and you were watching me brush my hair, there'd be some neurons in your brain that would be imitating that in your brain. It's called mirror neurons. And those help people to, you know, kind of understand what's going on in other people's minds. Those things are not working right in autism. And why would I put up boxes on forklift pallets when I'm going to be talking about emotions? Well, you all remember the big floods we had up at CSU that wrecked the library? And what they're doing here is they're packing up wet books so they can be freeze dried. And I was very upset having books wrecked because knowledge was being destroyed. You see, I am what I do rather than what I feel. And I got asked at dinner tonight, and I want to thank, um, uh, thank you all for taking me out. It's a really nice dinner tonight. Um, you know, what about faith and things like that? 
Well, for me, the most important thing is being a good person. I am what I do. And when you're dealing with people, you know, the, some of the dyslexic people and Asperger people, let's emphasize, well, building a house for Habitat for Humanity, for example. Something concrete that you actually do. I don't think getting off on a lot of fundamentalist uh, negativity and things like that, it's not where the Asperger mind needs to go. We need to be concentrating on doing good things in the community. How can you be a good citizen? You know, work in a soup kitchen, visit a nursing home. Those are the kind of things that we need to be emphasizing. And in fact, I think that um, all around the world we need to be emphasizing these things. When I was in high school, uh, of course I got fixated on cattle squeeze shoots, and I got this catalog from uh, the Silver King uh, Squeeze Shoot Company. And it had this quote in it that I never forgot. And I said, it's now the last sentence in my, in, I added little appendixes in the revised thinking and pictures. And, I, and, it, and it said, uh, men will fight for religion, die for religion, wrangle for religion, do anything but live for it. I think we need to be doing a lot more of the living for it. Well, we all know the emotion centers and autistic and Asperger brains are messed up and underdeveloped. We know that. And I think teaching social skills is extremely important. And we need to be, you know, and getting you know, autistic kids interaction with normal kids is extremely important. But there's some of these real smart Asperger kids, the computer nerd kids, I, I think need to be taken out of the social pressure cooker of a large high school where they're just getting tortured and teased. And I was one of those kids. And some of those kids need to be in with their intellectual peers, like take a class online, uh, get involved with other electronics people. And when I was in high school and getting teased, um, things like Mr. Carlock's electronics lab was a refuge away from teasing. Model Rockets Club, that was another thing I was in. And of course, horseback riding. And all three of these things, there wasn't any teasing. A really great thing for some of these kids is Lego Mindstorms robots. Boy, I, I think that's something that needs to get you know, started in a lot of schools because it teaches job relevant skills. Industrial automation, computer programming, something that's a whole lot more constructive than playing video games, which is just sort of a mind rotter. And I want to make sure that when I'm talking about things I don't like in video games, I'm not anti-electronic things. But what I'm anti is being hypnotized by mindless sort of shoot 'em up stuff. You know, there's other kinds of very interesting games you can do, simulation software for designing a city. And if the kid got interested in that, then you, you, you broaden that out into, you know, civil engineering and interests like that. You know, those kinds of things can be really good educational tools. I'm not against all electronic things. I saw this really neat electronic drumsticks you can plug into your iPod that I, that enable you to put drums into your iPod music. Well, if something like that gets a kid interested in music, I think that's great. But I, it, but I don't want them just zoned out on video games all day. You know, I got social interaction through shared interests. You know, we got to really work on, on the shared interests. You know, I'm not that interested in socializing just for the sake of socializing. In fact, I've talked to other people that are on the spectrum, successful people on the spectrum that are in things like computer programming. And I talked to this one lady, and she's married, and they love uh, to go to these really romantic restaurants, candles, finest wine and everything, perfect romantic evening, and then you get to talk about computer data storage systems. <laughs> because it's just so interesting. I mean, it's just nothing more interesting than a computer data storage system. And it's hard for some, you know, you see, for a lot of people, sort of social emotional relatedness is what makes the world go around. And we can teach the person with Asperger's to be more, have better social skills. But there's a social emotional relatedness they may not have, because the circuits aren't hooked up. And they're going to get the relatedness with other people doing stuff they're interested in doing together. And the happy ones are the ones that have got good careers. Now there's all different levels. We've got to find something that they can, they can do. You know, like maybe take a class at a community college. You know, in some of the best time of my life, I had working on construction. Man, it was really fun to sit around the job trailer and talk about how to build things. <laughs> and uh, we also talked about a lot of other 10-year-old boys club, you know, type of things and <laughs> stupid things. 
I'm very concerned today that, that uh, about all the bad behavior that young people are seeing today with sports figures doing. Because the thing is, as a high-functioning person with autism, I am much more influ influenced by my environment. I can learn to be a good person, or I can be learn to be a really atrocious person. You know, I was brought up when I was young about the importance of what do you do to do good things. You know, I, you know, I can really relate to you know Roy Rogers, you know, rules of conduct. You know, about about being a good person. You know, I think a lot of people think that's kind of old-fashioned and trite, but for someone like me, that was a set of rules that I could live with. You know, today we've got you know sports people behaving badly and not getting punished for it. And I have to say, I applaud the National Basketball Association for their dress code and for taking some of the stands they've taken against bad behavior. And I'm sorry, players, you are role models to kids. Like it or not. And if you don't like it, then maybe you need to be kicked off the team. Because I'm just very concerned about the message that that's sending out to kids. You know, movies that I watched when I was a kid had clear-cut values of right and wrong. They were clear-cut good guys and bad guys. You know, now we've got the heroes doing bad things. Well, for somebody that has to learn everything from the environment, you know, that could send out kind of a bad message. And when it comes to religion, let's, let's concentrate on the positive things and how to be a good person in the community because we don't want them off obsessing on a bunch of negative stuff. Because one of the problems you sometimes have in the Asperger brain is it can get hung up on negative stuff. You know, negative emotions are sort of the more primitive emotions. You know, there's been some brain scan stuff on this. There was an interesting brain scan study that was done where they put people in the scanner and they showed them like really nice stuff like skiing and sailing and all these like really pleasant things. And then they showed them like disgusting stuff like flies on food and dog poop. <laughs> and they looked at where the brain was activated. And for the real positive things, it was in the higher brain centers. And the more negative stuff was down in the more primitive parts of the brain. And, and we just don't want them going there. I'm a big believer in, in doing therapies to help relieve some of the sensory problems. Scratchy clothes were terrible. I couldn't stand to be hugged, you know, because being hugged just made an overwhelming tidal wave of stimulation. We need to be um, working on trying to desensitize some of these uh, problems. And I developed my squeezing machine. Because another big problem that came in adolescence was constant panic attacks, constant anxiety attacks. I felt like I was being you know, chased by a lion all the time. And I got the idea from this for, from a squeeze shoot for cattle. And I found that you know, the pressure calmed me. Pressure is calming. A lot of people on the spectrum find this. The other thing that comes to panic attacks is antidepressant medications, things like Soloft and Prozac, are extremely effective for calming down anxiety. They're much more effective for anxiety and panic attacks than they are for depression, actually. Depression and panic attacks are two different things. But drugs like Prozac and Soloft work extremely well for anxiety and panic. I wouldn't be here right now if I hadn't started taking antidepressant medicine in my early 30s. I had the type of anxiety problems that as I got older and older in my, my 20s, I got worse and worse and worse. I was one of the ones that absolutely needed medication for panic attacks. Now the thing is, it's very variable. There's other people on the spectrum that don't need medicine for panic attacks. And I describe this in detail in Thinking in Pictures. And I think it's very important to desensitize little kids to touch because that helps to have positive feelings. If I'm going to use a squeeze machine, I tend to have like much nicer dreams. Because the thing is, I can see the whole subconscious. And sometimes there's some pop-up ads there I don't particularly like. And <laughs> I know better than to talk about them. This is a rule system I still live with today. I take all the rules of society and I can put them in four categories. Really bad stuff. That's things like killing people, burning down buildings, destroying property, theft. You know, you can't have a civilized society if all that stuff's going on. So there's no reason to ever do any of that stuff. Then courtesy rules, those help people to get along. But then you've got to have a place where I can break some rules. A little illegals, but not bad. Like maybe you're, I'm enrolling a 12-year-old in an online university course. I'm not going to let anybody know he's 12 years old. 
because that might be just the thing that's going to help get them a good career. And then you have the sins of the system, very society specific things. And some little thing, a drug offense that would be no trouble at all in Europe, you're in jail here, you know, no logic, rule, boy, you don't mess with the sins of the system, there's no logic, they throw you in the slammer for 10 years for marijuana, that's like crazy. Or in Thailand, you just get hanged, you know, these are things that have no logic. Okay, I want to just go through some medication things. You know, you get into the whole medication thing, some people go, oh, you should never take medication. Other, you know, there's some people with mild things that don't need medication, but there's others that need it. And if you, especially when it's severe, and I've heard too many bad things happen where somebody was nice and stable on medication, they were taking a reasonable dose of something, and they went off it, had a relapse, and then when they went back on it, stopped, it wouldn't work anymore. Because if you get a bad enough relapse, you can like burn out some brain circuits. And that can happen with bipolar. Let's say you're stable on lithium. Go off the lithium, then we'll go back on. You had a big manic episode, go back on, and it doesn't work because you fried something. Then you might have to take Depakote. And I've been stable now for 25 years on the same medication. I don't dare stop taking it because I haven't read a journal article yet or any scientific study that shows that I could stop taking it safely. How do you evaluate a treatment? Well, I think with anything with medications, you have to look at risk versus benefit. You know, I-25 in snowstorms, real risky. And sometimes at night, you better not, you shouldn't be out there at night in a snowstorm. You know, I think anything, if you try a medication, you should go, wow! this stuff really works. And if there isn't some wow factor, then it's probably not the right thing. But people get into too many big fights about alternative stuff versus conventional medicine. That is just so stupid. Because lots of times, a little of each works very, very well. You know, I'm finding that uh, I've, I've had problems with potentially life-threatening infections, and I've got that under control with alternative medicine that I figured out for myself. I have to eat a, a cup, I have to eat a big tub of Dan and yogurt every day and a half. Yeah, and then I don't get these infections. Ugh, empty stomach, plain Dan and yogurt, yuck. But <laughs> the thing that I found out is it doesn't have to be organic. <laughs> it can be plain Dan and much easier to buy when I'm traveling. You know, I started out with the organics. I thought it had to be organic, but then I found that stuff from Safeway works also just as well. <laughs> Okay, let's say some of you are dealing with, a, with very people that are severe, nonverbal, either retarded or autistic, and you all of a sudden are getting behavior problems. The first thing you've got to rule out is a hidden painful medical problem that nonverbal person can't tell you about. <coughs> you know, maybe they got a tummy ache, maybe they got acid reflux, maybe they're constipated, maybe they have an ear infection, maybe they have a root canal gone bad. <coughs> That has to be ruled out. You know, if they're grabbing themselves around here and contorting themselves into odd positions, there may be some medical condition that's got to be, you know, tracked down and fixed. Or they may be, you know, maybe sensory stimuli. Okay, now somebody just brought a fluorescent light into the office and now you've got a problem. You know, and of course they can also be behavioral, you know, reasons for bad behavior too. But you've got to rule out the first two things first. And the mistake that a lot of doctors make is just throw more and more drugs at it, give them free samples and things like this. They got somebody on like eight different drugs. It's like ridiculous. Sometimes some odd combinations of two drugs in the same class of drugs will work. But you need to try one thing at a time. I don't care whether it's conventional or supplements or organic or whatever, but try one thing at a time. So you're using the things that actually work. Like when I started out my infection problem, uh, I couldn't, hadn't gotten that under control, I'd be probably dead by now. I was taking all these different supplements from the health food store. And I finally now I've gotten rid of almost all of that except for the cranberry supplement and the, and the yogurt and I got rid of all the other stuff. You know, I started out just throwing everything at it. And then I thought, okay, now, which things do I really need to take? Because it's expensive and stupid 
take too many of those things, that's not going to hurt me. But taking too many conventional drugs can really be a problem. You know, when conventional drugs work, they really work. And all I can say, you know anybody out there that's stable on, on Prozac or lithium or you know, anything, you know, Depakote, any of these things, and they're nice and stable, boy, don't let your prescription run out. Can't emphasize that enough. Well, here are some of the causes. Let's say you have a nonverbal person with autism. Maybe you've got a behavior problem they can't communicate with you. Sometimes they've learned they can do it to get attention. I knew one nine-year-old boy that would scream when mom approached McDonald's because he knew mom would stop. And he didn't scream when dad was driving because he knew dad wouldn't stop. And they might be doing it to get out of doing something. Okay, let's just look at some of the medications that work really well for, especially for us visual thinkers that get a lot of panic attacks. Now, I've also found, you know, there's a lot of people get, I know a lot of good people that do design work, you know, that have gotten into drug addiction and alcoholism. And one of the reasons this happens is panic attacks. And what got them off of the alcoholism and the drug addiction? A little help from things like Prozac, plus tons and tons and tons of good counseling. You've got to do both of those things. But what the Prozac does is it stops the panic attacks. It stops the urge to, you know, to abuse alcohol. I know three or four really good designers that combination of counseling and a little Prozac, they got their jobs back. Well, if you don't like Prozac, you might try Zoloft. <laughs> or Selexa or Lexapro, you know, one of the new, you know, newer ones. You know, you've got to find the thing that works. Paxil's probably not a good first choice. It's had more problems than some of the other SSRIs. And there's been a lot of controversy now about suicide in these medications. That problem, is, if it's, if it's going to happen, is only going to be in the first month. And if you read the black box warning, um, it's really not all that bad. Yeah, it's got a black box now, but the rate the FDA is going, I mean, half of all the drugs are going to get a black box warning. This is probably not a good first choice to start with, but if you're on it and it's working for you, you better keep taking it. You know, if you found out that you got two other family members that Paxil worked for them, then maybe you ought to start taking it. But if you were just going to go pick something off the shelf, it's probably not the best first choice. Now, there's way too many of these so-called atypical drugs given out like candy, things like Respiridol, um, things like Zyprexa for schizophrenia. They're using those for bipolar now. You know, who knows what the long-term side effects are. Way too much of that given out like candy. I think we'll uh, skip through some of this drug stuff. Okay, here are just some really basic principles. You've got to try one thing at a time. A medication or a supplement or whatever you're doing, it should have an obvious good effect. If you've got somebody that's on a zillion different things and you've got to get rid of some of it, take them off very slowly. Be careful switching brands from generic to regular or different brands of generic. They're not bioequivalent. They're supposed to be, but they're not. And I found that out just with my own medications. I'm on di diuretics now because I got autoimmune problem Meniere's disease, autoimmune problem. And I found that the cheap diuretics that you get from King Supers just don't work as well as the ones I get from this other little drugstore. They just don't seem to be bioequivalent. That's just diuretics. Now, diazad, you know, that's... And don't expect anything to give you 100% control because that's not going to happen. And one of the things about these anxiety attacks that I had is they went in cycles. And even now, they still kind of go in cycles. And I just stayed on the same dose and kind of toughed out those cycles. You know, let's just <coughs> beta blockers sometimes works really well for anxiety. I think we'll get through. Another thing that the research is getting very clear on is vigorous exercise. Very strong anti-anxiety research is getting very, very clear on exercise. Okay, getting near the end of my talk and then we'll do questions. I'll be happy to sign some books. Einstein would have been diagnosed autistic today. He did not talk until age three. In fact, there's a very nice book called Asperger's and Self-Esteem by Norm Legend. And it's about famous scientists and musicians. 
that probably were Asperger's. People like Mendel, a monk who did genetics research, um, Carl Sagan, Mozart, and a whole lot of other people. And I get worried today about these people getting stuck in the educational system because the skills are going to be uneven. Good at one thing, bad at something else. There's the book Asperger's and Self-Esteem about famous people that probably were Asperger's. If we got rid of all the genetics that causes manic depression, anxiety problems, um, autism, dyslexia, you'd probably get rid of an awful lot of really talented people. And, you know, and, you know years ago, um, a mental health professional wrote that if you got rid of all of these people, you'd have just a world full of dried up bureaucrats and that would be pretty, um, pretty boring. Here's the NASA Satellite Assembly Building. Boy, let me tell you, I saw a lot of Asperger people there. There's a lot of, a lot of Asperger people in engineering. In fact, there's two and a half times as many engineers in the family history of people with autism. And you get these engineering kind of nerd kids, they're getting teased. We need to be getting them into things like a Lego Mindstorms Robotics Club. Now, today I've you know, noticed you had several you know, retired engineers here in your group. Well, one of the things that a retired engineer could do a great job on might be mentoring some of these kids, getting them interested in engineering, giving them a reason to study. How can kids get interested in stuff unless they're exposed to it? You know, I've, I do a lot of interviews at radio stations. I've seen a lot of engineers at radio stations. I know they're mild Asperger. Just know they are. And they got a good job as a radio station engineer. But how can you get interested in that unless you ever saw a radio station? How do we prepare for employment? We need teenagers, and even you know, younger kids need to start learning work skills. Things like being on time. Sometimes you've got to do stuff the boss wants you to do even if you don't want to do it. Visiting interesting places. When I was 13, I had a little job on sewing dresses for, for a seamstress. And then I was able to go out and buy all these ugly striped shirts that my mother absolutely hated, the money. I interned at a research lab one summer. I interned at a school for autistic children one summer. These were very, very good job things. And, you know, I think maybe, you know, we need to be bringing in magazines and trade journals from work into, libra into the school library so kids can get exposed to different careers. You know, bring in journals like Science and Nature and get them interested in, in science. You know, how can you know there's all these interesting jobs out there if you don't ever read about it or... Another thing is, since I was awkward socially, oftentimes you need to short circuit the normal interview process and get in the back door and sell yourself by showing a portfolio of work. And the way I used to sell myself is I had a very nice brochure showing jobs I had designed. I'd send people drawings and pictures of jobs. And they'd go, ooh, you did that? I sold my work rather than, you know, because my interviewing skills wouldn't have been very good. Well, typical family history, autism has a very strong genetic basis. It's probably 60 to 90 percent genetic. You'll often find anxiety and depression in the family histories. It was true in my family history. You'll also often find intellectual giftedness in the family histories. You know, there's Lego Mindstorms. And now they've got even more elaborate ones now. Educational resources. Now well, we're talking about the real mild Asperger kids. Community colleges, technical skills. Some of these visual thinkers, they'd make great auto mechanics, great diesel mechanics. Contractors are screaming right now for diesel mechanics. Online learning, taking university courses. And there's the plant where my career started in Arizona. Swifts in Tolleson, Arizona. And how did I get into that plant? I met the wife of their insurance agent. <laughs> Not kidding. Sometimes you never know who can open up the back door. And you know what? She liked my hand embroidered western shirt. <laughs> you see, I was wearing my portfolio. So again, this gets back to the whole portfolio thing. And the thing is, you got to look for those back doors. And they're like the hidden figure test. There might be a next-door neighbor that works for the phone company and get a kid interested in 
working on phone networks, you know, to get a kid interested in something that can become a career. We need to be thinking a lot more about what they can do when they grow up. Because a lot of the real happy Asperger kids were in, in high-tech families, and when the kids are eight years old, they're taught programming. By the time the kids are 12, they're doing their parents' work online. Of course, we won't tell our employers that. But those are the ones that are, get into good jobs. There's all kinds of interesting things. Even in meatpacking plants, there's really cool, neat electronic stuff. This is an electronic warehouse where they can find any box of meat in it. You know, oh boy, if you like mechanical things, you're really going to like that. Let's look at some of the jobs. Good jobs for visual thinkers. Graphic arts, drafting, auto mechanic, fixing computers, equipment designing, photographer, training animals. These are all jobs that would use those skills. Computer network specialist, where you troubleshoot network problems. How about the music and math thinkers? Electronics, chemistry, engineering, physics, statistics, all kinds of math things. I know that there's lots of uh, mathematicians that are definitely on the, uh, definitely have Asperger's. You wouldn't have any higher mathematics without Asperger's. And how about jobs for the verbal guys, the ones that are not visual thinkers? Journalist, translator, librarian, analyzing stocks and bonds. Oh, and there's these things called actuaries. They might be really good at that. I don't even know what that is. Those are the people that determine risk for insurance companies. Special ed teacher, speech therapist, inventory control specialist. Then there's a job called order picker. You know, somebody, you know, when you, when you buy something from Land's End, has to actually go to a shelf, pull the shirt out of a bag, and put it in a box and send it to you. Doesn't get in there by itself. Somebody has to actually do that. Yeah, you know, but we got to think about careers and jobs that will fit the skills. And here are bad jobs for people with autism, people with dyslexia, people with head injuries. These are jobs that put a lot of demands on short-term working memory. Many people with many different brain disorders have really poor short-term working memory. Cashier in a busy restaurant, they'd have me fired in the first day. Waitress in a busy restaurant. It isn't the social part, it's keeping track of all the orders. You know, these are jobs that some of these regular jobs. Cashier in a grocery store, well, actually they've got that so computerized, it's, that's pretty easy now. But, you know, where you have to like juggle things in your mind all at once. I would have real problems with some of these jobs. You know, be a receptionist in the busy office and try to type at the same time? I would not do well at that. And how about nonverbal people? You know, the people that are more handicapped. Shelving books in the library, you know, and going into grocery stores and fixing the shelves where people have, you know, mixed up where the stuff is. Uh, doing inventory control with a little laser thing. Data entry jobs. There's a lot of things in lawn and garden work. You know, you got to find out something, something they can be good at doing. There's a lot of people, really good memory. And there's a gorgeous photograph that a person with autism took. No computer tricks here, no Photoshop. All a computer did, all he did with the computer is had, had him scan it. And it didn't manipulate the image in any way. You know, somebody with this kind of beautiful talent, we need to be getting that out to the non-autistic community. You know, there's some of my books. I have a little book called Developing Talents, which is a little careers book. It'll be useful for people with autism, also for dyslexia and ADHD. And we've got to emphasize on building the strength area. We've got to build up the strength area. I'm not saying we just totally ignore the deficits, but what happens often in special ed is they pound away on the deficits so much, they forget about the strength area. Now, that's just some places to get some more information. And um, I just want to thank you all for coming.
Thank you. Well, I think we'll just do a few questions and then we'll go, go sign some books. Okay, right here. You mentioned that one of the things that made a difference when you were very young was interacting with another person. That's correct. One of the things that made a huge difference with me when I was young was a nanny just spent hours playing turn-taking games with me and my sister. Like we'd, do, we'd play three-way catch. We'd take turns playing hopscotch. You know, take turns just going using one sled. And how did that benefit you the most, do you think? Was it being breaking out of your isolation, your mental isolation, and being able to? Well, a thing that you got to do with an autistic kid, first of all, you got to be careful not to drive them into sensory overload. I mean, these things were all done in a, real, you know, in a quiet environment. But another thing is you got to get an autistic kid doing lots of different things. Because otherwise, I would have just sat in my room and twirled this little brass thing round and round and round on the bed all day. Well, that's not a good thing to be doing. Since we're videotaping, could you repeat the question when it's Oh, asked? okay. The question concerned, concerned, um, you know, what what's helpful for very young autistic kids? And basically, it's you got to you got to keep the kid interacting. What's really helpful is getting a really good teacher to get the kid to interact. Now, of course, there's methods like you know applied behavior analysis. You know, you get a formal program and that's super expensive, but I think you can be just about as effective if you just get a good teacher, do some of the ABA stuff, do some speech therapy stuff, but also just work on, uh, on engaging the kid. I mean, let's say the kid's there twiddling a penny around and around. Okay, then I'm going to twiddle a penny around and around. Now we're going to take turns. We're going to get one penny and we're going to take turns. You now have got some interaction there. You see, and the thing that's really important is these kids need, you know, like, um, you know, I had like 40 hours a week of kept connected with the world. I had three meals a day where I had to sit at the table and have manners. I wasn't allowed to like just sit there and spin my fork around. But then I was allowed to have an hour after lunch where I could just revert back to autism. So the, the most important thing was being engaged? With well, little kids, the most important thing is keeping them engaged. I mean, both the practical and the research and, the, and everything is showing, you know, now, I didn't have 40 hours a week of strict ABA, low loss at a table. I'm not a big fan of that kind of real rigid kind of program. You know, but what's important is getting, is getting um, uh, lots of interaction with really good teachers where the kids kept engaged. I mean, I was kept engaged at, at lunchtime. You know, I had to pass things around to other people at the table. I had to eat properly. That was um, keeping engaged. Okay, in the back. How did the your autism inter interact with your animal work and your sensitivity to what works with animals? Well, one of the reasons, one of the things, one of the places where autism helped me in my work with animals is I don't think in language. So that's going to be closer to how an animal thinks. And some people say to me, well, how do you know an animal thinks in pictures or thinks in smells? Well, I've studied enough neuroscience to find out that just looking at how the brain's built, there's no other way they could think. They're going to have to think by taking on the sensory-based information basically off the primary hard drive, associating that together into categories. <coughs> you know, so the other thing that's given me a lot of insight is very extensive knowledge. I have a neuroscience that's subscribed to three neuroscience journals. Okay, right there. Okay, the question was, speaking now, am I translating uh, images into um, words? I have done these talks a lot of times, so there now are tape-recorded downloads I can spit out. But when I just talked right now about those neuroscience journals, I saw them. And one of them's on the dashboard of my car, and I saw it there while I was talking about it. See, as soon as I get into new material, then language narrates the images in my mind. So when you read a book, is it like a movie? Yeah, the question was, when I read a book, is it like a movie? Yes. Like I read something like, you know, Michael Crichton or Stephen King novel, um, that's like watching a movie. Now, I have problems with follow with, I don't particularly like mystery novels because there's too much complicated plot twists and I get lost in that. I like books that have lots of description, 
Like I remember reading uh, Michael Crichton's timeline about you know them going back in a time machine in medieval times. That was just like watching a movie. I read that and I just convert that right into pictures. Um, I wanted to ask you about the high school. Where did you go when you were kicked out? I was in a large girls' high school, and I actually went to a small boarding school for emotionally disturbed, gifted children that had uh, 30 students in it. And that was probably really a good thing. And I think, I feel strong, you know, you get into the whole mainstreaming argument, I feel much more strongly about mainstreaming elementary school kids than I do in high school. And what's happening with the high school is the low functioning kids, are, are, there's a lot of them are doing just fine. They don't tease them, they leave them alone. The kids that get teased are the ones that are much more normal. You know, the mild Asperger kids, and some of those kids are getting tortured. And I think they need to be taken out. And, you know, you have to look at how things are going. Or, you know, they might um, just go in there and take chemistry lab at the school and a few classes like that, and then online for other things, because you can't do chemistry lab online. So they go in at 10 o'clock, do the chemistry lab, come out, and they don't have to deal with lunch. Those, and, you know, times like that where they really get teased. You know, and the thing is, some people say, well, it's important for them to learn how to interact with their peers. You know, teenage life's a very short period of time. And, and interacting with teenagers is not a social skill that I need later on in life. <laughs> you know, you're, 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 kind of, you're kind of dealing with these hyper-social beasts that do really weird things. Like, I went into a convenience store, and this boy was in there, and he had like three dog collars on, and I'm going, oh, come on, man. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, so does your social life or being social matter to you now? What social life for me pretty much resolves around shared interests. Sort of chit-chat for the sake of chit-chat I find extremely boring. Most of my friends, I mean, they're interested in autism, they're interested in talking about animal behavior or building things. and. This is why I put so much emphasis on career, or if the person has a job bagging groceries, well then, let's try to get them a, a hobby at least that's good. So, so they have a shared interest that they can share with other people that have that same shared interest. See, so the thing is, I am what I do rather than what I feel. So do you, sorry. Okay. Do you, in terms of like a, a reciprocal conversation, is that just you know sort of rules that you follow, or in terms? Well, of I still have on the question concerning reciprocal conversations. I still have problems. I don't get the timing right, and I still have problems with interrupting the other person. And I'm not trying to be rude. I I have difficulty with that t timing. Now I've gotten better at it because you learn. It's like the more things I learn, the better I get at being in the play. Now the other thing is, in my early 30s I went on the antidepressant medication. And when you got the anxiety and the panic attacks calmed down, then it was easier to learn. You know, when I was constantly in a panic, that makes it really hard to learn. And I know there's a lot of controversy about whether antidepressants work or not. That's on depression. But let me tell you, on anxiety and panic attacks, they work fabulously. And I wouldn't be here without them. What is your take on the theory of thimerosal? Okay, let's, let's address the whole thimerosal and mercury issue. Okay, the Asperger's, which is the mild form where there's no obvious speech delay, they've always been here. I look back to when I was in elementary school and college, there were other Asperger kids. They've always been there. And, but where there may possibly be an increase is a type of autism where the child appears to develop normally, and then at 18 months to two, they lose language and regress. Now, when I first started doing autism talks back in the mid-80s, and I asked for a show of hands, I said, well, okay, how many parents have a, have, you know, have a child with autism? Okay, now they raise your hand. Then I said, well, how many of you had a child with autism where at age 18 months to two, there was regression, where there was some kind of a regression? And back in the mid-80s, that was maybe 20, 25% of the new parents. Well, that, that's doubled in terms of percentage of new parents. So something's going on there. And that's just my own little informal surveys I've done at meetings. 
and there may be other environmental contaminants that are getting in there interacting with genetics, you know, like plasticizers and solvents and things called endocrine disruptors. You know, there's an awful lot of, you know, pharmaceuticals and everything else going into sewage and going into sewage unchanged because it comes out the other end of the person unchanged and, you know, doing weird things to fish that happened right here in Denver. In a situation where you have two siblings, both of which are, are diagnosed as uh, autistic or Asperger, any comments regarding interaction between the two or the you have two siblings, one that's Asperger and one that's autistic. Uh, the question is how will they interact? I mean, it's all going to depend. You see, one of the things is, is, is autism and Asperger are very variable. Some are much more social than others. See, it's going to depend upon what gets wired. And the severity is determined by sort of how many bad computer cables you've got. But then, then whether you're social or not social, I mean, it's going to depend upon where the good computer cables you've got go. You know, that's the only way I can explain all these different, um, you know, the visual thinker, the music and math thinker, and the verbal thinker. Because there definitely are those types. Because there are, 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 are um, the verbal thinkers, boy, they don't, they can't draw. It's like their vi picture circuits were left out. <laughs> Okay, the question is, if you're a teacher, how do you figure out what kind of brain the person has? By third or fourth ki grade, kids with drawing talent should be showing it. I mean, if there's any access to art materials, they may not be drawing pictures just on, you know, notebook, notebook paper. And, you know, drawing talent, art talent will usually show up. Music talent, they've got to have access to musical instruments and in some instruction to show that talent. And if a school has gotten rid of all the music classes, then they're not going to have a place to show they've got musical talent. You know, you do have to have some instruction and be exposed to it. And the word thinkers, they tend to be uh, baseball statistics, uh, stock market pages, weather reports, and they usually cannot draw. You know, if, if they are in art class, they've got the worst drawings and, you know, and then the math thinkers, are they good in math? And then some of these kids that are really good in math can get totally bored because you're doing baby addition when they already know how to do multiplication. And I think with these kids that have, the, have these, um, you know, interests where there's one uneven interest, we want to make sure that we're keeping them challenged in math and not boring them absolutely to tears. You know, he may need special ed for reading, but he might, you might have a kid that's in, in second grade and he's doing, you know, seventh grade math and he's going to special ed for reading. You might have to do that. But I want to keep him challenged in math. You know, if he wants to go up to college math, fine. Let him do it. You know, build up on that talent area because that's what can turn into a career when he grows up. And we're not thinking enough about what's this kid going to do when he grows up. My question, the question concerned how to develop a sense of humor. It's something you gradually just keep learning. You kind of learn what jokes work, what doesn't work. When I first, when I first did public speaking, um, I had to do a talk on our graduate class, and I panicked and walked out. That was back in the early 70s. And you kind of, you know, you just kind of learn. You know, and you go, oh, well, that, that wasn't so good. I won't do, say, do that one again. They didn't laugh. And, you know, I found out the thing about, like, the way I do that computer data storage systems thing really works, so I like, I like to just really um, build up the suspense. <laughs> so I find Gary Larson cartoons funny. Yes, definitely. Okay. Yes, right there. Yeah, they, they, those lists are in my Developing Talents book, which, um, it, which is published by Autism Asperger Publishing Company. 
in Shawnee Mission, Kansas. Um, you can order, it's called Develop, if you type my name, you know, Temple Grandin and then Developing Talents at Amazon, you can get it. Or Borders, I'm sure, back there, I forgot, shouldn't have mentioned, uh, Amazon when we've got a bookstore um, <laughs> back there. Um, I'm sure that Borders could order it for you. Um, you just have to make sure you, um, you type uh, my name correctly into the, you know, into the computer, because if you spell my name wrong, the computer will not pull it up. Also, if you just type in Developing Talents, Okay, now we'll talk about Amazon. If you just type that into Amazon, you get all kinds of other stuff. You've got to put my name in there. Or if you just put my name in there, pull, it will pull up all my books and you can find it. But that's my careers book. Also, there's a web page, autism.org. And, and when you put, get the home page of autism.org up, you've got to scroll the home page down. It's an old-fashioned type of web page. You've got to scroll it down to get to where my papers are. And I do have a careers paper that does have some of those lists. But anybody that's really interested in careers, I'd recommend getting the Developing Talents book. And I think people are going to find it useful for dyslexia, also for ADHD, and for quite a lot of the other learning problems. OK, well, let's get somebody else right there. Okay, you said you have a nine-year-old daughter and she hates barcodes and black and white stripes. That's a sign of a visual processing problem. And I bet you she also hates escalators. She's not too fond of them, yeah. Well, you see, the problem with escalators, see, okay, let's try to figure out some ways, you know, to troubleshoot, see if you've got a visual processing problem. She probably hates fluorescent lights. Hating barcodes would be, you know, diagnostic of visual processing problem because they're probably vibrating and shaking. She probably really hates them when they're on airline boarding passes and it's like all over it. In fact, that would be a good, um, a good testing thing, print some of those out really big. She has like a panic attack with barcodes. She has to turn them around. She actually has a panic attack with barcodes. I would, I would strongly recommend, um, uh, you know, looking at the Erlen lenses and maybe, you know, it's going to cost you like $500 to get tested for the real ones, but if you want to just play her, how, how is her reading? She um, is reading about at grade level, but, um, but she, she reads like younger than her grade level for fun. But she, well, you know, you see, the thing is she may have, the print may be jiggling around. The fact she hates barcodes tells me you, I would certainly look into the Erlen lenses and you know, if you can, if, you know, if, if the $500 is, too ex is not too expensive for you, I would go for the real thing. If you're in a low-income situation, I would uh, recommend taking the barcode thing that she hates the most down to Walmart and trying on the different pale glasses and see if she can find somewhere she can tolerate looking at the barcode. Where would you go to, to, to look? To there is somebody in Fort Collins doing it, and it's spelled Erlen, I-R-L-E-N, Erlen. Erlen Institute, you can look them up on the internet. They got a list of different places that, but I, there are some people where this really helps and, and, and you see in the black and white stripes are the kind of thing they're gonna hate because they see that just jiggling and that barcode's just all wiggling and jiggling and, okay. Okay, right there. You mentioned uh, that sometimes it's good to take autistic children into school for one class and then get them out for lunch and all the other. Especially the older kids. Is, um, what's your take on homeschooling supplemented by going to school for kids? Okay, my question was what about homeschooling? My, as I said before, I feel more strongly about mainstreaming younger kids. I want to see elementary school kids getting, you know, hopefully they can, usually elementary school, you don't have all the problem with teasing. But then you get the real smart kids up into high school and they're getting tortured and teased. Some of those might be better off homeschooling. But there's also so many good things online, too. I mean, they could be taking classes at a community college. Um, you know, maybe just go into the school, into the high school, take some of their labs, you know, chemistry lab, biology lab, some of those things, go into school and take those classes you know, and avoid some of the lunch stuff. I think you got to look at each individual situation because there's some of them in some high schools where it's working fine. It, but these big high schools, some of these kids just get completely lost 
where you might have an Asperger a teenager in a rural high school where he may be doing just fine and he's in FFA and he's taking auto mechanics and, and having a real good time. I mean, you have to look at each individual situation. People get ideological about things like mainstreaming. I think you've got to look at, you know, there's some that need to be taken out of that high school social pressure cooker and there are others that don't. Okay, right there. <coughs> what? How old is he? 15. He's 15. Okay, now is a 15-year-old working at grade level or close to it? Yeah. He's, well, you... It, and my question was going to be if there, you know, for adults, sometimes there, there are... Um, okay, let's okay. The question is we've got, we've got two teenagers. The question is we've got two teenagers, one that's developed an interest in, in doing really well in it and the other one that's not. Okay, let's look at the one that doesn't have an interest. What's his best subject in school? Science. Okay, well, that might be some place we can develop an interest. You know, maybe, uh, maybe get him involved in uh, a science fair project. You know, this is something where, you know, working with a teacher, you know, you start somewhere with something that he's at least kind of interested in. And then as he gets working on it, he might find he really gets interested. What does he like doing? <coughs> He just wants to stay home alone and not be interacting. Okay, now we. Yeah, so we try to get him out and do all kinds of things. Well, one of the things we've got to make sure is he's not having panic attacks. Because when I was his age, I was in non stop panic attacks. And that's going to make you not want to get out and interact. And the thing is, there seems to be one kind where when they get into puberty, the panic attacks are just tearing them all apart. Then there's another kind of Asperger's that just stays, stays calm and cool and absolutely doesn't need medication. But he might be one of the ones that need to take something for panic attacks. Does he tend to be hot and sweaty? And yeah. Is he sweaty? And he is taking stuff. He's taking something. Now, the thing you've got to be careful if you're using something like Zoloft or Prozac for panic attacks with people on the spectrum is giving too high a dose. If you give too high a dose, you're going to have a really bad, wrong effect, like agitation and insomnia. You know, oftentimes they need, one, they need a much, much lower dose. And maybe, I think, maybe I need to talk to you individually later. Okay? I know you're talking about autism and the related things, but have you done any research or writing on uh, stroke victims uh, in terms of processing information? Okay, the question concerns stroke victims. I've done, you know, some reading on head injuries. Of course, strokes kind of do the same thing. It wrecks things in the brain. And, you know, the kind of problem you're going to have is going to depend upon where the stroke is located in the brain. You know, where a head injury you can get in a car accident, get like, you know, frontal cortex completely smashed in. And that can sometimes really mess up the person's social life. You know, if they're doing a technical job, they'll be still okay at that. You know, it's all, and the stroke is all going to depend upon where you get the stroke and how, how bad it is. But one thing that has been learned is that if you work really hard on rehabilitating the person, sometimes the brain can rewire and route around the damage, sort of make a detour around the damage. I think we'll do two more questions and then we'll... What about the panic attacks? Okay, the question was, was I getting panic attacks because I was anticipating teasing? Well, no. Yeah, when you were a teenager, were you kind of anticipating what you needed to do as an adult in life school? Well, on the panic attacks, let me tell you, they were pure biology. Okay. Pure biology. Now, you know, depression is much more amenable to counseling and to talking and <laughs> cognitive therapy. These panic attacks were pure biology. And uh, when I took the medication, the panic attacks 90% went away three days later. You see, for the antidepressant effect of the medication to work, it takes like three weeks because you've got to grow some neurons. 
but panic attacks, it did something in three days. So that's a different mechanism. And boy, I can tell you, I just know, you know, meatpacking plants are um, designed by um, people taking Prozac. <laughs> because a lot of the visual thinkers, it seems like visual thinkers tend to get, often tend to get a lot of panic attacks. And I can tell you right now, if it hadn't gone on medication 25 years ago, I wouldn't be here. I was being ripped apart by panic attacks. I had all kinds of horrible stress-related health problems. And there was no way that talk therapy or anything like that was going to work. You know, you get into the things where people, you know, get totally anti-drug. Well, I can tell you this. Panic attacks, the real severe ones, that's um, one of the places where, where SSRI drugs, things like Prozac and Soloft, really work. Talk about mainstreaming uh, younger children in public schools. Uh, does that include the, or guide them to a special needs side of that elementary or...? Okay, the question concern if you have a young autistic kid, do they have to be in special ed? I mean, it's all going to depend upon the kid. I mean, you've got all different severities. Now, the thing I get concerned about if you have a very mild Asperger's, uh, I've seen some very mild Asperger's that ought to be going to the community college and university going down the special ed rut where they shouldn't be going. But there are going to be some, um, you know, the problem that special educators have is they've got to deal with very severe all the way up through a mild Asperger's. And their training and everything is, is much more suitable for the very severe. And they, and they often do a, they know how to work with those kids. They don't know what to do with a really smart Asperger that wants to do computer programming. So they don't know anything about computer programming. And he needs to be taught computer programming. It, it, I think you have to look at each situation very individually. And don't get too hung up on an ideology, you know, this way or another. Take a kind of a, you know, eclectic approach. Try different things that work. Another thing I can't emphasize enough, and I'll finish on, up on this, is the importance of really good teachers. And there's going to be some teachers, when they work with your kid, they're going to really click. And there's going to be other teachers that are going to be bad. I found out tonight that Temple Grandin's life is going to be the feature of a movie on HBO that is just starting to be made. The director is here tonight with us, Moises Kaufman, and uh, it was a pleasure to get to know him, and it's also exciting to know that her life is going to be th that feature. Moises is the one who made the Laramie Project uh, about that, that issue several years ago. So thank you for coming, Moises, and we're looking forward to the movie. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.